Hello, assalamualaikum and namaste. Welcome to Building Alternate Documentary Distribution Pathways in South Asia, uh, one of the pal panels for uh, Dharamshala Film Festival's uh, talk session uh, for their first digital edition. Um, today, we're gathered to speak about how to build knowledge and share knowledge um, as we um, try to build an ecosystem um, in South Asia for documentary distribution uh, that is independent and sustainable. And we have with us, uh, you know, today, a, a panel of people who are, you know, doing innovative um, community-based uh, and, and local initiatives to, to build audiences for uh, cinema. Um, and I think we have an opportunity here to really think about what are the next steps, um, especially uh, in terms of how documentary distribution exhibition is shifting uh, this year. Um, so I'm going to go alphabetical with the introductions. Uh, we have uh, Alok Adhikari here, uh, who is the Assistant Director of Film South Asia, uh, which is a biennial uh, documentary festival that was started in 1997 in Kathmandu. Uh, Alok also works as a documentary film and video editor and runs a small production company named Pulbutta. Uh, Gayatri Nadia is here from Indonesia. Uh, she works at Collective, uh, Collectif, uh, which was established in 2013 uh, and works with the community to develop and deliver activities, including film screenings, discussions, workshops, community management and capacity building. She's also part of Kinosaurus, a micro cinema in Jakarta, which was established in 2015 and runs the regular art house cinema with fringe events, including artist talks, filmmaking workshops and, and exhibitions. So the indie uh, exhibitor for, for uh, Indonesia. Um, Miriam Chandi Menachari is here from India. She's an independent filmmaker since the last 15 years. Her films Rat Race and Leari Notes uh, were both directed and produced by her. Um, and she experimented by developing a model of theatrical release, festival circuit, educational screenings, and broadcast to distribute her films. So a lot to learn from you, Miriam. Uh, and uh, also you are currently thinking about sustainable models to distribute indie films to reach newer audiences and to generate revenue so filmmakers can continue making films in these hard times. Sidel Willow-Smith is here from South Africa. She is the founder of Sunshine Cinema, which is a solar powered mobile cinema operating in four countries, I believe that's correct, hopefully in Africa, and working with youth ambassadors to activate communities. Um, and I, I can't wait to hear more about how you guys work because it's very fascinating. Um, finally, last but not least, Tariq Ahmed is here from Taka Doc Lab, which is the pioneer uh, platform for pitching and mentoring of documentary filmmakers. Taka Doc Lab organizes an annual event of pitching for South Asian documentary filmmakers. Uh, besides that, Taka Doc Lab also engages itself through uh, organizing workshops, masterclasses, seminars uh, for documentary filmmakers of Bangladesh and, and South Asia. Um, so uh, today's discussion is hopefully more of a round table where we can all, you know, all learn from each other and our strategies for the work that we're doing, but also what our vision is for what we want to do next. Because um, I think just across the board, we're looking at sustainability, funding and growing our audiences uh, as, you know, a, a hard task ahead of us, especially with physical spaces um, uh, in some ways being close to us or becoming more fragile. Um, I, I'm going to start by asking some of you some questions to learn more about your work, and then we can maybe even ask each other questions and we can uh, open up the discussion. Um, one of, in one of the IDA's uh, Getting Real uh, conference seminars, you know, somebody said that uh, success is a function of access to networks. And so uh, that is a very interesting idea for me, and then that speaks a lot to, to privilege uh, and uh, equity in, in terms of while we're building um, these audience base and networks for, for cinema, um, how do we keep these, uh, how do we keep this access uh, equitable uh, for various communities? And we all come from parts of the world where there is, uh, you know, a massive inequality in terms of who is making uh, documentary films and then who has access to watch them. Um, so, and I also, you know, what would like for us to then define uh, distribution within th those parameters? Um, so I'm going to start. Um, I'm going to start with Alok uh, in Film South Asia because uh, you know you guys have been operating for so long. Um, uh, and in terms of uh, what I've learned recently about your work, 
how do you think that the archiving process that you're currently involved in or building, how is that something that's going to supplement your the distribution work that you already do? Um, well, to begin with, the distribution work we already do is right now, it's an early stage, it's right, uh, so we have not done a whole lot yet. But um, we do have, uh, so because we have operated from 997, where we, when you, we used to get these massive um, VHS tapes, and uh, I think they're called U-matic tapes, uh, we still have them in our archives, and we have not even been able to digitize many of those archives yet. But uh, we do want to, so something we've been looking into uh, over the last year is how we can not just digitize them, but make them available to communities, to universities, to educational institutions, uh, but do it online so that anyone can access it from anywhere. And where we, the hurdles we run into immediately when we do that from a place like Nepal is financial transactions, who can pay from where, uh, from outside, because our countries, uh, Nepal, India, the South Asia region, tend to be closed in terms of that, uh, that issue in particular. So, uh, but what we are hoping and what we're, our dream is to really be able to digitize everything and bring it to a platform where anyone from anywhere in the world can look up a film made in 97 or 99 and be able to stream it immediately. Uh, this has also led to, we have also seen other hurdles in this process because like oftentimes many of these filmmakers, they may have, may have made like one or two films and have stopped making films altogether or they're not around anymore or they're, we cannot reach them. So in terms of, with our archives in particular, in terms of just getting in touch with some of these filmmakers from over 20 years ago has been difficult. Um, but, uh, our distribution, our ideal distribution model would be one where we can use this massive archive to help promote newer films as well, because we'd be, we'd be saying, oh, we have these amazing films from last year, but we also have films from the last 20 years from this region that people often don't get to see, uh, or people, very few people have seen over the last 20 years. Mm, yeah, I don't know if I completely answered the question, but... So, I mean, I think I see that as, you know, knowledge production archiving as, uh, as a way to build power, uh, but also a value add for when, when you do approach educational. Um, and and my, my follow-up question would then be how, how difficult or uh, is it to approach educational institutions? And is, is that work that needs to be done from the ground up? And I, I know Miriam has been thinking about this with me a, a, a lot as well. So I think we're very curious to what you've encountered? Um, well, um, since I've joined, joined from South Asia about a year and a half ago, uh, so uh, since 1907, we have this traveling package of films called the Traveling from South Asia. And uh, TFSA is one place, uh, one aspect that's been really successful, especially over the last three or four years in really, mostly in the West, unfortunately, but really uh, taking our films uh, a package of about 12. This year we have 15 films. Case is a bit different for this year, obviously, but uh, we've been really successful in taking these films to Europe and US and Canada uh, in uh, various colleges and universities. University of Michigan uh, this year, for example, is one of the few places that is also doing online screenings for their students uh, through their private servers uh, as well. So. Um, in the West, it has not been that difficult, to be honest, in approaching and saying, we have this amaz amazing collection of films from the last few years. How would you like to screen them? And oftentimes, the South Asian Studies uh, Department or the Film Department has shown some interest. So, uh, or the Anthropology Department, for example. So um, that has, I wouldn't say that has been particularly difficult, uh, but you, it's also a hit and miss. We, we do have to send a lot of, cold email saying, hey, we have this, are you interested? Sometimes we get really positive feedback and we have had relationships with these uh, places for like multiple years. Sometimes we don't hear back. Sometimes you would expect uh, a in large institution to have the little bit of fun to do a, a festival like that, but either they're unwilling or they don't have the funds altogether. So 
Uh, it's a hit and miss, but I wouldn't say it's been extremely difficult either. I think we're gonna, we should come back to the idea of educational distribution in South Asia, because I think that's one of the primary agendas for, for today. Um, but but Thaik, I'd, I'd like to ask you, um, you know, Dhaka Doc Lab, the decision makers are generally um, not from South Asia in terms of the people who will be doing the fund, uh, who could be offering financing to filmmakers, but I know you're making an effort to expand um, uh, who those decision makers are. So do you see possibilities for uh, distribution that is uh, maybe independent from, from the West in any way? I think, um, uh, yeah, it's really possible. But uh, to me, uh, uh, um, our agenda or our uh, idea is uh, quite different from that because, uh, you know, uh, particularly in terms of documentary, uh, the decision makers, uh, industry professionals, they have their own agendas like television, particularly if I talk about the Western uh, media, television and other medias also, and, and online streaming platforms are becoming more important. Uh, what I think uh, uh, in terms of, uh, if you talk about distribution or exhibition, uh, two things is very important. Uh, you need to find some national partners locally. Uh, if you can create yourself uh, national funding, national exhibition system, or national distribution platform, uh, uh, that really is missing in Bangladesh. In terms of mainstream cinema, it's almost gone. And if you talk about documentary, which is uh, never there, uh, with a few ex um, exceptions. Uh, Another thing, what we are uh, now planning and what my idea is uh, to look, shifting the loop of, uh, because um, in terms of uh, 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 this, uh, what is happened actually, uh, it started before the COVID and uh, during this COVID situation, uh, yes, um, I already had uh, uh, talks with a number of uh, uh, North American producer, and festival managers, uh, they said that, oh, uh, it's really difficult to have films from uh, countries like uh, South Asia or Southeast Asia, it's still difficult. Particularly the independent producers, I cannot name, uh, but I can uh, say that uh, it's still getting difficult. Same thing goes with the European ones. Um, uh, 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 a number of them uh, having their say that, okay, it's, uh, now is not a good time for us. Maybe look, uh, towards future, maybe 2021 or 2022. Uh, uh, if the COVID is over, then we would look forward to uh, get uh, um, projects from countries like this region. But what I think, uh, that's what we try to promote. Uh, perhaps you saw that uh, during our Dhaka Doc Lab this year, we have a session on Korean documentary industry. And what I think, uh, uh, particularly if we look towards these countries, uh, Korea, China, Japan, Taiwan, uh, even Southeast, Southeast, Southeast Asian countries. Um, um, uh, Gayatri is here uh, from Indonesia. Uh, she could uh, perhaps uh, let us know a bit more uh, because uh, that's why, uh, that's where we can uh, shift our look uh, uh, because if, Will make us from our countries uh, wants to get funds or wants to have their films released there or wants to exhibit their film uh, 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 in somewhere uh, uh, um, around Asian countries particularly uh, to show them in audiences bigger audiences I think that's the possibility we would look for uh, to my uh, 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 idea is to uh, build a more uh, uh, consolidation on national funding. That is our future idea. I can share some experiences, what we are planning in um, uh, in coming years. We are now um, uh, planning to build a South Asian Institute. Uh, uh, it's a sort of uh, film school, a documentary school, uh, which we are planning maybe the next year or 2022. We are looking forward to that. And we already are uh, planning um, uh, in collaboration with some other partners also. And uh, uh, yeah, we are trying to push the local funding organizations, particularly we have a national grant for cinema, uh, which is providing money, uh, yeah, almost um, uh, 1 million in local currency for the documentary filmmakers also. 
Also, we are now collaborating with a museum, which is called Liberation War Museum, uh, Dhaka Dock Lab, and the Lib museum is collaborating uh, for organizing workshops where they are providing money for two particular projects. Um, one is getting uh, 500,000 in local currency and another one is 400,000. So we are trying to build that collaboration so that will make us can get support for production. And that museum is having their exhibition because uh, they have a, not quite a good number of uh, documentaries in their collection. They are now planning uh, to uh, uh, run a YouTube channel and promote them uh, uh, through the uh, other their network because they have their own network worldwide uh, with individual and uh, 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 also um, uh, network of museums uh, all around the world. So we can, we are trying to promote the documentary filmmakers, particularly the human rights issue documentary filmmakers. They are trying to promote through that channel uh, uh, so that our films also can be shown in that channel. So my idea, my initial uh, plan is like that. Right. Of course, and Diagon, you're, you're mostly on the development uh, and financing end of films. Uh, and so I still wonder, you know, how do the films get seen locally, but these international partnerships that have um, a bigger digital imprint uh, seem like one approach. Um, Sidel, I, I'd like to, um, I'd like you to introduce uh, a lot of what you do uh, to the group, because um, everyone might not know, but also how uh, how you guys are pivoting uh, this year and uh, how technology plays a part in what you are doing, because it seems that uh, that that is the realm in which we are trying to find some sort of salvation. Hi, everybody. Thank you for having me on this panel. Um, it's really interesting. I've never had the opportunity to really engage with the film world and the distribution world in South Asia, so I appreciate um, being here. So the Sunshine Cinema is a solar powered mobile cinema network in South Africa, Zimbabwe, Zambia, and Malawi. And what we do is a mixture of distribution as well as a youth development program. South Africa, for example, has a very high unemployment rate amongst young people, around 30%. And as many know, Africa has one of the highest populations of young people in the world. So what we're trying to tap into is how can we help develop the creative industry while supporting young people. Um, a lot of the industry in South Africa, the film industry is centered around service provision. So we have a lot of international films that come and advertising that comes and gets shot in South Africa. But the majority of the high profile crew on those sets aren't South African. So what we're trying to say in our distribution format is how can we promote the local films that have been made and have been supported by international outlets and get to go to all these festivals around the world, but they never really get shown in cinemas on the continent. We have a huge lack of cinemas on the continent. In South Africa, we only have two independent cinemas. The majority of the cinemas are cineplexes, which show um, American and British blockbusters. So what we do with the program is we work with distributors and sales agents and the filmmakers to um, secure educational license fees for the films. And we employ young people from rural communities where we give them a cinema that fits in a box. It's called the Sunbox. So in that box is a projector, speakers, the films, a facilitation guide on what the films are about, um, solar panels, a generator, and blackout material, which essentially means that they can go out and they can do the screenings in uh, a bar, a church, a school, a house, wherever. It's a, it's a pop-up cinema that allows them to screen to about 50 people at a time. And the screenings are free to the public which is also how we secure the licensing deals with the various films um, and distribution agents. We face a big challenge in Africa where a lot of our historical great films from West Africa, for example, are the, the distribution rights are owned um, in France or owned by the Martin Scorsese Foundation. So it's actually very difficult for those films to get seen on the continent. So we're trying to address that through this distribution platform. Um, COVID has obviously had a huge impact on this work, 
all the countries that we operate in went under very strict lockdowns for six months. Um, they're slowly starting to open up again. So we are actually doing screenings again and having trained the ambassadors in COVID protocols and providing them with temperature thermometers and masks and hand sanitizer. So the screenings that they're doing at the moment are for about 20 people at a time maximum. But in terms of operating in the online space, one of the biggest challenges we have in Southern Africa specifically is that we have some of the highest data costs in the world. So it's actually very difficult for the, the average person um, to, to be able to stream content on their smartphone. So while a lot of people have smartphones, access to internet is, is still a huge barrier. I mean, you can go to Kenya and you can pay one tenth of the price for a gigabyte of data that what we pay in South Africa. There's a monopoly on, on data um, through four different telecommunications companies that the constitution we've tried to take them to court, but still the, the data thing is a huge barrier. So we've actually really struggled with pivoting into that online space because of the audiences that we are accessing are very rural audiences. They're not really in um, urban areas. So yeah, I don't really have any magic um, answer to that to that challenge. There have been some film festivals in South Africa, as I'm sure many are aware, that did go online this year that had huge numbers. I think one of the big reasons for that was that um, they made all the tickets free. So Durban International Film Festival, Encounters Film Festival, the tickets were free and they had huge numbers of people watching that content. But obviously that sets them back for next year because every year they, they really struggle to get the funding um, available. We do have some government support in terms of distribution, but it's quite limited and that particular department has had big issues with corruption in the past 10 years, which they're trying to now address. So we actually don't get any government funding as of yet, but most of our funding comes from people like the Open Society Foundation, as well as youth development platforms, farmer focused projects, it depends where we're working so yeah and we also get support from places like participants who want to do impact tours of films like the boy who harnessed the wind so we rely on those kind of strategies we're not really supported by the south african film industry or the government i think it's it's really smart to, to sort of tap into impact funds for for bigger films or bigger, bigger production companies and, and use that to subsidize your work um Gayatri, you also are working on a community grassroots level for for a film uh, exhibition. Um, so please, uh, if you could introduce what you do to everybody, but also my, my main question for you is, how did you go from um, free screenings to converting those same audiences into paying customers? Okay, hi. Thank you uh, for inviting me and hi everyone. So. What we do in collective, uh, as it names itself, is uh, how we work all together because uh, even the mainstream cinema in Indonesia, it's still uh, independent. So I don't know how to address ourselves uh, as an art house and also including documentary, also uh, still hard to, to distribute uh, within the country itself. But what we do since 2000, uh, 2013 until now is working with the community which actually uh, consists of makers but also the local audience and we distribute most of the films uh, that never release in the mainstream cinema because back in the early 2000 it's so hard for the Indonesian filmmakers to have their film screen, uh, just like others probably struggling uh, with the competition within the Hollywood. And here, probably more like Korean film, also big. So that's the struggle. So we try to get into that kind of opportunity so we don't depend on how long the Indonesian film uh, can actually screen in the cinema, but it can stay like for five years we can list down like there are like top five film that still have a high demand in each of the cities or you could say like each of the five main islands uh, and that's how we do it uh, to keep uh, all of those film available until uh, of course until like the contract with the filmmakers done but we still like keep uh, keep 
keep it longer and longer. And I think in the past five years, uh, the whole 30 to 50 titles keep growing. And even we open for like demand, uh, if you want some of the film with a particular uh, activity, even for like in school or even now it's getting uh, bigger for like in company, they like to have their, their, their company have like um, uh, activity together within their HR <laughs> department, then they put film, sometimes they can choose, sometimes they ask us to program itself. So we seek all of those opportunity. And for your question about the free screening and the paid one. So to be, to be very clear, since the very beginning, we never really screen a free for free. And that's uh, how we also put the audience as our uh, you know, target for the the education itself. We try to educate it, educate the audience through this kind of system where even though it's the film you never heard before, you still have to pay it. So you, we don't want people to just go to that uh, uh, to that event, just like, oh yeah, it's raining outside. I just wanna stay here, watch some film. And then when the rain is done, like just like left. No, there's a appreciation within the money and the time you invest to the people who held the activity and also the product itself. So, uh, but we put some range of uh, number of like the donation or the ticket thing from uh, even for like 50 cents back in 2015 that happened. Uh, and now like um, maybe um, $3, it's like the maximum number for uh, people to pay. So yeah, that's how we do it. And sometimes we do like cross um, uh, compensation. If like uh, some of the activity, like I told you before in the event of festival or in the uh, office, they would like their um, audience to just free uh, to watch, but they still have to pay the screening fee. So at least for the filmmaker, it will never a free event, never a free lunch uh, for the audience, but uh, the organizer and the audience can uh, have those parts to split or sometimes we, uh, not sometimes, most of it like 70% of the system is uh, split into the, the organizer itself so they can actually use this activity as a regular event that can fund their own uh, organization so they will see it as uh, financially independent because I know it's hard to always uh, depend on the funding or grants and also there's a lot of competition in the country so I think at least they can have their own like minimum uh, saving for each of every organi organization hope it answers that's you know that's that's lovely and I, I, I wish I wish we could emulate it in Pakistan. So with the Documentary Association in Pakistan, we are doing the same. We, we do community exhibitions uh, and, you know, we're still in the space where we have to keep screenings free or we feel like we have to keep screenings free because independent cinema is still, you know, in, so, so marginalized. Um, but Miriam, uh, so you're, you're sort of thinking the same lines as Gayatri uh, and we've spoken a lot about how we can use educational distribution or institutions within South Asia to, to develop this re revenue stream. So what are, like, if we can share what you think are the biggest obstacles in developing uh, this model? You're, you're muted, Miriam. Yeah, I'm thrilled to go after Gayatri because I think 15 years as a filmmaker and I've reached the point where I'm very clear that free is not valued basically. So, and in India, it's the opposite uh, problem where you have like a industry that's kind of churning out uh, movies at uh, such high stakes that there's a uh, very little room for independent cinema because you're always competing for attention with huge budgets and stuff like that. So it's really important to kind of think innovative at the same time, value the kind of uh, films that we make and, uh, so therefore, I think that um, out of three experiments as a filmmaker, I'm, I'm very clear that when I make a film, uh, the way I can um, kind of generate revenue so that I can continue making films is by broadcast rights or, you know, uh, that's the bulk of where it's going to come from or like uh, uh, international festival screenings. But at the same time, as a filmmaker who's making a very rooted film in the community, you want it to be screening 
in your home place. You want it to get the response it deserves from where it's rooted. So I think for India particularly, I've always looked at like, what are the alternative ways you can get it out there? And one is to compete mainstream in the sense uh, to get your film into the theater means that I'm putting my film side by side a big release. And it may be a limited release, but nevertheless, it is getting um, some kind of attention, some kind of traction and a lot of uh, written material, which itself is not happening in the country, you know, kind of viewing an independent film, reviewing it in a way that evokes interest and a different kind of uh, pedagogy about it. So one is that, and the other is to get it screened in educational institutes, which actually I find a very feasible um, alternative because uh, simply because many of them do have libraries, they have uh, film screenings as part of their curriculum and uh, most of, more often than not I've been invited to screen my film with a discussion so I see it as like you know if I'm doing it as an independent filmmaker there's always scope to have a, a collection of films that can be screened and they do have the budgets with each of these uh, departments to, to reimburse even if in a small way to the filmmaker so you do have that as you know, a, a, a small way of at least valuing your film and ensuring that, you know, other films are screened that way. So uh, one is that uh, we, uh, I had tied up with the uh, Film Federation of uh, India and we had brought in a group of uh, films made by women directors in South Asia. And we did these uh, alternative screenings uh, in like, um, what do you say, co-working spaces as well as educational screenings um, and it was interesting, you had, you brought in like a different uh, diverse audience in each of these screenings. You had uh, films from uh, Pakistan, Nepal, um, all over, and they were all by women filmmakers uh, and Bangladesh. Uh, in some cases, we were able to organize these Skype discussions with the audience. Um, so I thought it was like, uh, it got a good response, partly because it had a theme, we kind of put it out on Women's Day. Uh, it was, if I was doing it in Bombay and it's uh, whereabouts, there were simultaneous screenings happening, say it's happening in Kerala and in other places. So that I thought was an interesting model that you had a theme and you had these different facilitators who could uh, identify uh, a circuit in which it could play out in. Um, the other thing that I, uh, the two other experiments, one is that, um, we, I tied up with a, a theater chain called PVR uh, Cinemas, which is the biggest theater chain in India. But what uh, they have as mandatory is corporate social responsibility, which is something that is mandated by the government. They need to spend some of their money on, um, you know, something that's um, for the greater good. And in that sense, education is a is an area that has already been identified. So when we tied up with the uh, PVR, I could do like 100 screenings and workshops involving uh, the independent filmmaking community. And it was not just for privileged schools. We did it for schools, colleges. We also reached out to NGOs. And uh, we again had a theme which was open spaces and environment. So besides having the screenings, uh, which were paid for by PVR, and uh, we also got the kids to make their own modules of films, which in turn could screen in the theater with PVR. Some of the films were so good that PVR started screening it before the main film, you know, which was like a huge kick for even the, the kids who made the film to like, you know, have the screening where their community could come and see it on the big screen. So I see a lot of scope for that. I think that, uh, you know, a workshop come screening model is something that would have value and you, you can reach uh, audiences and students you never thought that you could by tapping into this corporate social responsibility, uh, you know, budgets that big corporates do have to have. In India, at least you have to have it. And the minute you go into the educational space, what I find interesting is that uh, the the need for say censorship or the censor certification which India insists on, um, it's, it's uh, not as rigid because it's in a classroom space and it's like, you know, uh, something that a faculty member can tie in with their curriculum, 
it could be gender, it could be environment, uh, more theme-based uh, sort of curation. Uh, but it's something that could definitely work. And I see that, you know, my films do really well in the like international educational screenings. Like you're getting such a good revenue from every screening. I really don't see why it's not possible in uh, South Asia. It's more a question of like, you know, uh, creating this sort of a network and uh, people who can facilitate it in each of their geographies and work it out with the specifics of each country or geography. So I, I feel like a lot of what you're talking about is uh, comes also within the realm of what, what is now deemed impact work, right? And and it's it's a lot of hard work in building those contacts and finding these opportunities and fundings to, to do these interventions. And so I'm wondering, and I think this is not a time where we can all sort of like open up and uh, sort of jump in as, as we need, how to make this scalable so that, you know, this data that we create out of nothing for our films, for our individual films to make them successful and have them seen, how can this data be shared um, on a region regional basis or, or even a countrywide basis to, to start, you know, a, a little bit smaller. Um, uh, and, you know, when you talk about educational, I think about Pakistan and yes, you know, there's smaller funds to be um, tapped into for, for, you know, speaker fees, at least, if not screening fees for, for filmmakers, uh, but we have the added uh, you know, Pakistani educational spaces are very much under attack right now. So, you know, they, have, you know, I can't email the dean. I would be uh, emailing directly the the professors I know to be safe and to be allies. And then, and then, uh, and that's what we've been doing with the Documentary Association of Pakistan. Anytime we have uh, looked at universities, so I just want to interrupt there, Anam. It's exactly what you said. So when. After we finished the IDA session and we were talking about a database, I feel like there is a problem over there that it's not about data and knowing which are the institutes that will screen. It is actually about building these relationships and knowing the specificities of how they can screen. So I think there's a danger in just kind of creating a database and putting out information or a contact person. I think. Uh, you know, there, there's a lot of nuance lost in that process. I think it is about having these people, whether it's DAP, whether it's FSA in Nepal, or, you know, these people who get the ecosystem and can work within the ecosystem so that it, it is a fragile one, it's still being built. So uh, I don't think, you know, it's about putting out data as such out there. So. And again, this is for everybody. If so, a, yes, we are as individual institutions, possibly uh, the people that can be reached out to, to do this kind of work and do the effort to build this kind of database. But again, the arts institutions I feel in South Asia are also beholden to Western foundations for money uh, to carry on our work. So, like, how do we how do we manage a sustainability model for us uh, so that we can start building these power networks uh, for ourselves? And uh, a second sort of like B part of that question is, Sadal, I know you're doing, uh, you have a podcast element to Sunshine Cinema, Gayatri, you guys are, you know, doing a lot of sort of side activities. Mariam, you're talking about workshops. So how much do we need to now become diversify and become uh, multidisciplinary uh, in order to survive? Can we first uh, think about uh, to build an informal network? Yeah. Uh, that's what we were talking about in uh, IDA and also I think uh, here, uh, because uh, to me, if we build a, not a formal network uh, and not to have a formal database, but if we can share information directly or indirectly, that might help us through a network. Uh, that really can start soon. I mean, uh, yes, because I know in Bangladesh, there are organizations uh, um, yeah, I'm particularly individually supporting them uh, in different cities. They are um, 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 uh, exhibiting documentaries uh, physically and now uh, online also. And in some cases, they want docu uh, uh, documentaries and information about uh, filmmakers from outside Bangladesh in many cases. Even in, uh, I know uh, in India, perhaps uh, Miriam knows, uh, Vikal uh, in Bangalore, uh, Sunanda, uh, she connected me yeah. to another filmmaker 
Indian filmmaker. And I had to prepare a list of um, uh, quite a good number of documentary filmmakers along with, it's a good database. I have to prepare for her. So that's, uh, I think, uh, if we can develop a network uh, among the South Asian countries, um, uh, particularly also, uh, we have friends from Indonesia and South Africa. Uh, we can uh, learn from their experiences, how they are working. Already, uh, it's a good lesson from me particularly, uh, uh, as Sittal informed us about their mobile cinema project. Uh, I think first we can do to build a network, informal network, not a formal one. If you build a formal one, that might create some problems as you are already talking about. Then we can share information. Like, uh, um, I know uh, about Film South Asia, they're having a package, um, as Olok is saying, I also know, because um, uh, yes, quite a good number of times, uh, we have shown this package in Bangladesh, in, because I was part of Short Festival years back. And also in Chittagong, I know uh, there is an organization, they are showing the films. This year also, they asked me, okay, how can we show the film? Uh, I said that uh, you can connect them or you can connect um, them through me. Um, Individual efforts are inside Bangladesh also. Um, uh, individual efforts, uh, they are showing films in their own way, online, also physically. But first, I think we need to build an informal network, not a formal one. Then in a formal one, you need to have your registration and some of the things. But that's how we can start at least. And if we can start somewhere, then after some time, yes, there will be a database, not a formal database it will develop gradually. That's what my idea is. I, uh, I totally agree with Tariq. Uh, and I think conversations like these and the one uh, at ID are like the base for those kind of networks. I would like to correct myself from earlier, though we do have screenings in educational institutions, a uh, few in Bangladesh, not a whole lot, but a lot more in India, uh, even in the last year and a half. Uh, there were a couple of me to attend it herself or to talk to the students. And those do go really well. Uh, it's just, it's a bigger struggle for institutions here than it seems to be in the West. Um, uh, regarding, oh, and, and something like Sidel, I think the work you do, I had not heard about it, but it's amazing. And we at so before everything, all, everything is before and after this pandemic. Before this pandemic, what we were planning was to take our TFSA package uh, to really the grassroots. Our first screening, we were planning a Dharvi uh, in Mumbai. And um, we were also in the process of translating all our films so we could dub them into regional languages so that people who can't read subtitles can still watch the films and get something out of it. So uh, we do hope to bring that back up. And I think just hearing about some science cinema, cinema gives me so many ideas about how that could be done. Uh, finally, uh, in terms of the uh, screening in educational institutions, something that I find really interesting in the U.S. is there's this platform called Canopy, uh, K-A-N-O-P-Y, that connects libraries in, in the U.S. Uh, in, within educational institutions, but also like the Brooklyn Public Library, where once you get a membership, you can log in and watch films, uh, all sorts of films for free. Uh, and a basic network like that I'm dreaming a little bit here, but a basic network like that for our part, part of the world would be amazing in not just connecting these institutions, but bringing these diverse independent films together on an online platform. Uh, but yeah, I think, again, Miriam's point about being at a, it being a workshop is also important. So I guess that's a different level. I totally aspire. I think we should we can aspire to that level in terms of the just the vastness of, of the region. And I think Karen Chien uh, during IDA also uh, was proposing the uh, alternatives to canopy that are you know uh, a little bit more the revenue share is better. So you know there's there's that diversity of uh, these aggregators uh, for the lack of better words that that also exists. So and you know it would be nice to have one in South Asia. Um, in terms of being multidisciplinary, I think that's something that I, that I feel like uh, could maybe be addressed. Um, if if that, is, that is an approach to take in these hard times where funding seems to be um, slashed all over the place. Can I add up 
to that. And uh, what we do beside the community and engage them to be participate uh, participant of all of our activity because um, uh, the bigger picture every year we have this highlighted films that we want to distribute every year and we kick off to have all those attention and then we split uh, everything to the whole country. Well, unfor well, fortunately and unfortunately, we did it uh, just like a week before the whole uh, lockdown happened. For me, it's a bit fortunate because at least we have all the exposure, but then what we do next, that's because the, the big question mark, because we, we actually have this one uh, title, the documentary title is very, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's coming from the long uh, director who haven't uh, released everything and we already planned everything with whole campaign but again we can't do that but it's not that nothing we can do because uh, just like Anna mentioned about the whole other um, activities related to the education part of our main uh, objective uh, apart from the distribution is also the distribution of the education uh, which is aligned with audiovisual. It doesn't have to be film sometimes, but at least to engage more uh, participants who already have an eye for, let's say, even theater or startup, they can be part of our community. But then to have grants from other partner, usually like from Japan or from the British Council, I think it's uh, important to at least put ourselves in the map. So whenever they think of uh, film whenever they think of the working with community at least they will like oh yeah I will work with collective and whenever they open something to uh, for like funding we apply even though we know we can also get from the local government but again to put ourselves in their map maybe uh, it's a like a steps that we can use because the the money itself is actually not gonna not gonna fund it just for ourselves because we, uh, what we do with that, we travel. Let's say we travel with this d director and then uh, we screen the film. But that's uh, just like the beginning of having like three days of workshop or master class. And then within the situation, we still can do that apart from the screening. And then we can just say like, yeah, you can, you can watch their film later well don't know later but still the distribution of the education coming from the director that we we vouch it's still it's still working uh even though for them maybe some of you already start producing but here it's still like super hard they just like producing for don't know when they can release the film but at least that's that window we can use for that kind of activity and that's also one of the main goals in our organization to have at least uh, go to this area, uh, like very rural or uh, there's an island in the uh, east of Indonesia. It's called uh, East Nusa Tenggara, if anyone knows, it's, it's quite far, but the community there, that's impressive. They have even scaled up their building. I remember five years ago, they only like rent a very ugly building like somewhere, but now they can have like the contract with a cafe or something like that but they're a dedicated place they can do anything even like now i ask what do you do we still shoot something we don't know what it's going to be like documentary uh, during pandemic something like that but they still do something for that at least there's a there's a light that never go never goes out whenever the situation it's hard i think the harder is sometimes the better for for like this kind of uh, community that's for me. Um, I yeah, I, I agree with you. I think that that's been something that we've really um, learned from during the pandemic because we were kind of just doing our screenings and running the program with young people and it was gaining traction. But when we had to pause all the screenings, it forced us to look into other strategies, which led to us training the young people to make podcasts which they now do with filmmakers and activists. Um, we managed to get those on a data-free website so that listeners didn't have to pay for the data. And that also led us to look at impact producing because the, the young people we work with are being trained in impact producing. The majority of the screenings that they do have some kind of educational activism focus to them. We're lucky in South Africa that there's quite a healthy social justice 
um, space for civil society and it's quite a free country in many ways to to voice out concern so we have a lot of our screenings focused on government accountability active citizenship um, gender-based violence but that also led us to look at an income revenue model in terms of developing an actual course with a local university that we will then be making available for third parties to take and profits from that course will then feed back into our um, operational expenses because what we find is that a lot of people want to fund the young people and the cost of the cinemas but they don't want to fund our operational costs so we are magically meant to have internet and salaries and an office but that that's not funded so we've been strategizing around that so i agree that this this period has actually forced people to to reconsider these models in in healthier ways but in saying that um we have submitted over 40 proposals during the pandemic and received zero responses so who knows what will happen next year i might not be sitting on panels like this <laughs> we need to eat cinema and you know use it to power our our houses, I suppose. Um, but but what I, I feel like what I'm hearing across the board is that in our parts of the world, you know, uh, cinema is not, or documentary can't just be seen, that connection with audiences can't just be seen as consumption and entertainment. There, there, there's an added value and, and that's just part of what audiences need. Um, my question to Sidel is, uh, and, you know, excuse my ignorance, uh, in terms of if you're working in four different countries and you're getting uh, films from you know uh, all over Africa, I'm assuming, uh, are you uh, as part of what you do is provide uh, subtitles or closed captioning uh, in different languages uh, so that the film can travel better? So in um, South Africa is actually the most challenging country, um, but in Zambia, Zimbabwe, and Malawi, we find that even rural audiences have a pretty good grasp of English particularly in Zimbabwe and Zambia. So if we're showing films from Kenya or um, the majority of the films we show are from Southern Africa and Kenya, still we're working on expanding, but people can read the subtitles. In South Africa, it's more of a challenge um, because of the history of apartheid and the Bantu education system in the rural areas where we work, the, the grasp of English is much, um, is, is, much more challenging so then if we do get funding um, for dubbing we do dubbing but otherwise the ambassadors actually will do like live translation of sections of the film so the show a portion then stop the film then translate but yeah it's 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 challenging in a country where we have 11 official languages to work out which are the ones that you're going to dub into or translate into so what we normally do is like, if you can speak Zulu, you can understand Kosa and um, uh, Siswati. So if you speak one of the root languages, you can understand the other one. So we tend to choose which of those key ones and work from there. Um, that's, I mean, that's very a relevant question for I think all of South Asia in terms of the multiplicity. Uh, Alok, how do you guys handle this? Because you guys are distributing uh, all over South Asia, or exhibiting uh, all over South Asia. You're, you're muted. Sorry. Yeah, um, we are exhibiting all over South Asia, but uh, our because in, in within South Asia in particular, because uh, our screenings have been constricted to uh, institutions, it has they have been uh, uh, projected as they are in whatever language they are in so far. So uh, that hasn't uh, we have not this not this is something relatively new for us as well, uh, and like. The this year going online and everything like to be really able to reach the audiences, rural uh, grassroots audiences, we're realizing we have to have to have to do the dubbing because otherwise it will, people and we have to do it in person and we have to do real live screening. We cannot just put up put it up online because people it's hard to get people to start watching documentaries to begin with. So um, yeah, but this is something we don't have as much experience with as Sudal does. I'm wondering if that's like a direct action thing to do is to, to like uh, develop that into our budgets or something into our impact plans to, to uh, you know, provide those extra versions of our films as, as a, 
as a means towards more regional distribution of our content. Um, uh, one, one second, Anam, just want to respond to that. So uh, a group of filmmakers here in India, we, we formed a, a, a loose network called Indie Doc. And we tried on another experiment, which was to tie up with all the film clubs across India. So these were not in metros. They were in extremely rural areas as well. It was a combination of uh, uh, spaces where films were being screened. And we actually screened a Bangladeshi film because uh, we, we kind of brought in a collection of films and decided on this one uh, film because it was like very sort of visual and it, uh, uh, tackle climate change and um, surprisingly like in India you know there are like that many languages like uh, you know 40-50 regional languages and uh, despite that despite uh, like screening a Bangladeshi film and all we did was have a Facebook page where all the audiences across the film clubs could post uh, sort of um, when they were viewing as well as like comments or uh, whatever they wanted, a picture comment or whatever. It was really surprising the way the film, despite the language, connected to all these uh, regional audiences. And, you know, at that time it was an experiment and because we were filmmakers, we didn't go forward with it. But all the film clubs kind of got back to us. In fact, what Tarek mentioned when Sunanda contacted him, it was, I think, for the same experiment where she was involved with Vikalp and also we were trying this at the same time. They all contacted us for more sort of films that could screen across, you know, these multiple regions, local, uh, you know, in the uh, two local audiences, but it had a way of connecting. So I think that is, a, I don't think that, uh, you know, kind of the budgets or whatever those constraints shouldn't be kind of stopping us from getting started somewhere. I think we can get started somewhere. And when you prove that there is a sort of audience for it, uh, probably the budgets will follow as well. Totally. Uh, I, yeah. I know. Uh, uh, that's, that's the same thing, uh, I must say, because uh, we have film societies in uh, most of the educational institutions, even in remote areas, I know. Uh, if it is an university, uh, government university or a college, uh, uh, big colleges having film, film clubs, and they used to show um, films from other countries also. And uh, I don't think even I don't get any complaint from them that uh, th this film needs to be translated in local language. Mm. That's the same thing uh, Miriam is saying. It's almost similar here. Uh, subtitles or something like that, it doesn't make sense uh, to them because they are really smart. They enjoy the film, uh, whatever the language is. As they can read the subtitles and enjoy the films as well. And I must add uh, what uh, Miriam is saying. Uh, if you can start an informally um, and sharing, um, um, yeah, Himal is having a package all, uh, already. Because you can develop a package, uh, data and information about a good number of films. Uh, we can uh, at least experiment uh, that's what informally we started uh, uh, from uh, Dhaka Doc Lab, uh, sending emails and informations to um, friends and uh, institutions in India, also in Nepal, and maybe inside Bangladesh also. Because I'm particularly, uh, uh, it's a good connection with uh, uh, neighboring Indian states of Manipur, Assam, Nagaland, and Tripura uh, filmmakers are uh, connecting me individually. Also, uh, uh, we have invited a number of them at Dhaka Doc Lab. Also, I'm part of a film festival, which is Liberation Doc Fest. They are invited there also. So that's why how uh, um, uh, we got connected through um, different networks, different channels. Uh, and I think it's, it's more necessary uh, if you can develop a package of uh, uh, films and filmmakers' information uh, through a network. 
And I, I hope that's a distillation of, of the, the series of conversations that we're, we're putting together in, in these weeks. Um, I, I, do, I do know a small underground uh, film collective in Hyderabad, Pakistan, uh, and the work that they're doing is translating science documentaries into, you know, local languages. And I think that in that way, it becomes, you know, there's, there's cinematic documentaries and then there is access to knowledge and power, which, uh, you know, is, is, is not available. Uh, necessarily uh, to us uh, in our part of the world always. Um, so I think there's there's a bit of space for that. Uh, my question to everybody would also be, um, also, and to add to that, I think, you know, Sidel, the fact that there's life translators and, and local ambassadors that sort of help you with your network, I think that's fascinating. And part of like most of the money that we spend uh, with our traveling film festival is just, you know, even if we're just taking, you know, <laughs> bus, public buses uh, to and from locations is the logistical cost. And, um, and even I think digital distribution has been, you know, the cost for setting up I think if you if you want to uh, uh, talk about money, uh, uh, I'm sending the money uh, for the to the filmmaker. You need to find alternative ways uh, rather than looking for uh, uh, to, to go through some payment gateway. Although it's, uh, uh, recently I get to know that if we run online workshops, we can get uh, tax waiver from the uh, National Board of Revenue. That's what they told us because uh, it's the I mean the outsourcing professionals, uh, freelancers. They are having these uh, waivers, tax waivers. So uh, we are thinking about that that kind of way to organize work workshops more on online. And if you talk about um, uh, the payment uh, uh, about the filmmakers, uh, that's how we are doing uh, in terms of providing uh, award money and uh, um, honorarium for the overseas uh, um, uh, mentors and tutors. Uh, uh, in some cases for Doc Lab, many cases for Doc Lab. Uh, we are trying to find alternative uh, ways uh, so that the uh, person can get paid and also we didn't get that much difficulty uh, to send over the money. That's why we need to find an alternative solution. There is no permanent um, kind of uh, payment gateway things uh, you can deal um, um, uh, in South Asian countries is quite possible. Even in countries outside South, South Asia from Bangladesh, I can say that we are trying to resolve this in other ways also. I think across the board, we just, you know, we have to be chameleons a little bit working uh, in, in our parts of the world and working in the arts. Anam, uh, like through these multiple conversations, probably a pan-Asian model is difficult, but what if there were local collaborators who were, you know, uh, figuring out, including payment um, for their respective regions, you know, and then uh, getting it back to the filmmakers. It's a way of kind of a, um, multiple collectives sort of networking to create this Pan-Asian model rather than like a central sort of uh, headquarters where everything happens rather than that you kind of, you know, break it up. Totally agreed. And then that can service the local and, and the sort of the, the macro as well. Um, I think I'm, I'm hoping that all of us here uh, in South Asia, South Africa, Indonesia can stay in touch and that the little pods uh, that we represent can, can connect and stay connected. Uh, and, I, and I really appreciate your time for being here, but also the incredibly hard work that you all do uh, I, I know it's it's not easy to create these networks and sustain these networks and uh, sustain ourselves um, uh, while we do this work that is often uh, not very self-serving at all. So I really appreciate appreciate all of you and thank you for sharing your knowledge um, and I and I hope that we uh, continue this uh, as Tarek said with our informal network, informal but very ferocious network. <laughs> Thanks, Anam. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Lovely meeting all of you. Yeah. Bye.